I found on the internet that explains um, how the life cycle of Ebola works. So what I'm going to do is on the next slide, I'm going to draw, draw that out for you so we can talk about each stage of the life cycle. So let's start out with the Ebola virus and the capsid. So I'm going to draw the capsid in green. So kind of this long twisty thing. And in orange, I'm going to indicate the presence of the membrane surrounding the capsid. So I'm not going to draw it all the way around because I don't have enough artistic ability, especially on the iPad. But those little orange um, lines represent the fact that the capsid is surrounded by an envelope. So what happens when the virus is going to enter the cell, and let's go ahead and draw a piece of the cell. Let's start out right here. So here we have the cell membrane. And of course, since Ebola is infecting human hosts, it doesn't have to worry about dealing with a cell wall. So what happens is the virus attaches to the cell membrane. And the method of attachment isn't entirely sure, though, like I said previously, it might have something to do with the proteins that live in the viral envelope. So it attaches to the surface, and here we have our virus, and it attaches to the surface, of course, via the uh, proteins and receptors that live in the membrane of the cell. So it attaches. And what's kind of interesting is the way that the Ebola, Ebola virus is engulfed by the cell is a little bit different than the standard way that viruses are engulfed. Instead of the uh, what I showed you in the first handful of slides, the membrane actually comes over like a wave and captures the viral particle. So let me draw that here. You can see that the membrane comes over like a wave. And what you end up with is a, um, a cellular membrane surrounding the viral particle. And that looks like this. And once again, we have our virus, and it's still attached to the membrane via the cellular receptor. And at this point, it still has its envelope. Let me draw the pieces of the envelope right there. So once it has entered into the cell, there is an event, and not, people aren't really sure exactly what triggers this, but the viral particle is released from this vesicle, essentially, that it's in. And during that process, the viral particle loses its envelope. So what you end up with is the capsid portion of the virus. And of course, inside the capsid is the genetic material. And at that point, the virus can start replicating its genetic material and also creating the proteins that are necessary to form more viral particles so it can go out and infect more cells and more people. A couple of details regarding how that works 
remember that this is a negative single-stranded RNA virus. So what that means is if you take a close-up look at the viral um, genome and you draw on here, this is the three prime end and this is the five prime end. So the viral genetic material needs to do two things. I think I mentioned that. It needs to replicate uh, the genome and it needs to make the proteins. So the way that it makes the proteins is not that complicated. It uses RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And that is polymerase that performs transcription from RNA. So most of the time, if you think about normal transcription, you think about the normal way that cells will go from DNA to RNA to protein, the template molecule is DNA. However, for RNA viruses, the template molecule is RNA. And so that's one reason why these viruses pack their own polymerase into the particle is because there are a lot of uh, you know, cells um, in eukaryotic organisms don't tend to have RNA-dependent uh, RNA polymerase. So to make the messenger RNA is not too difficult because the messenger RNA is, let's see, let's draw the messenger RNA in a slightly lighter blue here. The messenger RNA is sense, so a five prime to three prime. So once you make the messenger RNA, then that can directly go off and encode proteins, encode viral proteins. So let's just draw, so here we have our mRNA. And this is kind of a close-up view that I'm showing you, but now here are a little bit further away view of mRNA. And now the virus can take advantage of the host cellular machinery, so the ribosome. And this time let's do our ribosome. I think we've been doing our ribosomes in purple. So here's the ribosome. take advantage of the host ribosome and start making proteins. And in this particular case, one of the main proteins that it's going to be making are the capsid proteins. Those are the green proteins that protect the genetic material. Okay, so now we've established how the virus uses the polymerase that it packs with it to make the mRNA and then uses the host machinery to make proteins. Now we need to talk about how it replicates its genome. And that's a little bit more complicated than how a double-stranded DNA virus replicates its genome. So I'm just gonna make that smaller, move it up here, make that smaller, move it up here so that we have room on the slides. Now, what the virus can't do is it can't simply make copies of, make positive uh, stranded copies of itself because it's a negative strand virus. So what happens is that it goes through several steps. So let's, I'm just gonna label a few things here. So if this is our viral uh, genetic material, if we wander up this way, this is making proteins. And as I draw down this way, this is making copies of its genetic material. So what happens is that the first step the first step is the same as when the cell wants to make proteins. That is it makes a sense strand 
copy of the genome. So let's just draw here. It makes a sense strand. And then what it does is it uses the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase to make a single-strand antisense copy. So that is what, let me circle that, this is what gets packaged up into the capsid proteins and enables the virus to leave the cell and to go on and infect other cells.